Good morning and welcome back to our second panel of the day. We'll be, uh, for those of you who are online, thank you for sticking with us through this first of our breaks. We'll have another short break before our 11 a.m. panel as well. Uh, for, to introduce our next guest, I'd like to welcome to the stage my good friend, one of the uh, sponsors of today's conference, Arrow Augero, Director of America's Public Policy at Amazon, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Ken, for the introduction and for hosting this year's conference. We're all so lucky to have a leader like WIDA who can bring us all together for such great programming. Today, I have the honor of introducing the Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade, Marissa Lago. Um, as you all already know, Undersecretary Lago has had a distinguished career in both public service and in the private sector. In the Obama administration, she served for seven years at the Department of Treasury as the Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Development, where, among other achievements, she was instrumental in working with the World Bank and other regional counterparts to increase access to capital for women. She also held top roles in city planning and development in both Boston and New York. Prior to her time at Treasury, she led international affairs at the U.S. Ex Securities and Exchange Commission and was the global head of compliance at Citi. In her current role, Undersecretary Lago leads the International Trade Administration, where she is responsible for assisting and promoting American businesses in international markets, enforcing fair trade practices, promoting travel and tourism, and engaging in commercial diplomacy around the world. This work includes playing a key role in commerce's Indo-Pacific economic framework pillars on supply chains, clean economy, and fair economy. At Amazon, we are thrilled to have Undersecretary Lago and the entire International Trade Administration team focused on supporting American exporters, especially small and medium-sized businesses. In fact, just over a week ago, Commerce and Amazon launched the Go Global Initiative, a new program that will help thousands of small businesses across the U.S. expand their businesses globally. Through the partnership, ITA and Amazon will provide training and resources to help U.S. businesses harness the power of the Internet to reach more customers around the globe. We look forward to building on this work with ITA and couldn't be more delighted to have Undersecretary Lago as a partner. And with that, I'll welcome Undersecretary Lago to the stage. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, good morning, and thank you to WIDA for the invitation to be here with you today. The more than 2,300 members of the Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration, or ITA, work every day on building a more prosperous, inclusive, and secure economy. We're strengthening communities and enhancing our economic resilience by bolstering the competitiveness of U.S. industry and workers. We do this by promoting exports, facilitating investment, and ensuring fair trade practices. Equity lies at the core of our efforts, serving all businesses regardless of size, and expanding opportunity to ensure that the benefits of trade reach more broadly across our communities. Our work is grounded in the conviction that economic security is a key element of our national security. Between the economic fallout of COVID-19, Russia's unjustifiable war against Ukraine, and strategic competition with the People's Republic of China, the imperative to bolster economic security has only grown. Our economic security depends upon our nation's competitiveness on the global stage, which begins with safeguarding our strength and our resilience at home. The Biden-Harris administration has made historic investments in our nation's competitiveness, over $1 trillion through landmark new legislation. These investments are equipping our nation, our businesses, and our workers to compete and win in the 21st century global economy. ITA supports U.S. companies doing business in foreign markets, foreign markets that are home to over 95% of the world's consumers. The data are clear. Businesses that export generally earn higher revenues, create more jobs, and pay better wages. But the power of trade 
extends beyond export flows from encouraging the development of high quality industry informed technical standards to advocating for fair wages globally to setting the rules of the road for next generation technologies Trade is a lever to advance our national interests, and this administration takes an expansive view of the power and the promise that trade offers. While the current environment might not be conducive to signing traditional trade agreements, make no mistake, we are making breakthroughs in creating commercial opportunities on behalf of US businesses and workers, and all the while strengthening our role in the world. We're deepening trade ties with like-minded nations to ensure resilience, counter coercive influences, and protect our national security. We're launching new commercial and investment frameworks in fast-growing regions. We're eliminating barriers and fostering cooperation in essential commercial areas, from digital trade to technical standards. We're embracing leadership of international institutions, including putting forward ITAs own Ian Saunders as the US candidate for Secretary General of the World Customs Organization, something that we have not done since the 90s. We're promoting investment into the United States so that more cutting edge products continue to be made in America. And since not all countries play by the rules, we're ensuring that what is made elsewhere on the globe is traded fairly in the US. So let me get a bit more specific. I'll start by giving you an overview of our activities across the globe. I'll then describe some sectors of the economy that are of particular focus. And I'll end by providing some insights into how we implement our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So here's the tour of the globe. In the Western Hemisphere, we're leaning into long-standing engagements, having restarted the high-level economic dialogue with Brazil, and having hosted the 20th US-Brazil commercial dialogue. Through these and other partnerships, we're improving the business environment in our own hemisphere, removing barriers to commerce, and creating new opportunities for American businesses to build resilience. In Europe, we're deepening our solidarity in response to Russia's war of aggression, helping allies meet near-term energy needs and plan for long-term energy security, as well as already preparing to support Ukraine's reconstruction. We're also tackling next generation challenges through the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, which works to align our transatlantic approaches to export controls, secure supply chains, data governance, and investment screening. In Africa, we're growing economic engagement grounded in mutual respect and shared interests. Less than two days ago, I returned from Tanzania and Zambia, where I saw firsthand the tremendous promise that African markets hold for US businesses. Capitalizing on the momentum from this past December's US-Africa Leaders Summit and Business for, uh, Forum, my foreign government counterparts and I worked on converting promising dialogues into, into practical, robust commercial relationships. So I'm gonna end my tour by noting that we're working to ensure a free, open, interconnected Indo-Pacific and prepare for next generation challenges. With 60% of the world's population, this region is projected to be the largest contributor to global growth over the next 30 years, which is why it's crucial that we deepen our partnerships there. This includes building consensus around shared priorities during 2023, when the United States is hosting Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC. It also includes fruitful bilateral engagements from the US-Singapore Partnership for Growth and Innovation to the US-Japan Economic Policy Consultative Committee. And of course, we're breaking new ground with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. That's a mouthful, so we'll call it IPEF. Let me talk a little bit more about IPEF as it is a cornerstone of the administration's efforts to reassert US economic leadership and engagement in this dynamic region. 
We have joined with 13 other partner uh, countries with the shared goal of increasing shared prosperity, shaping technological innovation, and tackling economic challenges while boosting trade and investment. This engagement will yield benefit, benefits for partner nations, uh, nations, but also for US businesses, workers, and families. And we're determined that these benefits be broadly and equitably shared. The Department of Commerce is leading three IPEF work streams. First, we're working to build supply chain resilience to mitigate disruptions and foster collective action in critical sectors while supporting workforce development and labor rights. Second, we're capitalizing on the clean energy transition by helping to unlock the IPEF region's abundant clean energy potential and promoting low and zero emission goods and services. And third, we're leveling the playing field for businesses and workers among IPEF nations by combating corruption, strengthening tax administration, and enhancing transparency. IPEF promotes an affirmative, open vision for economic engagement, but it is impossible to discuss the future of the IPEF region without addressing the challenges posed by the People's Republic of China and ITA's role in addressing them. In a half century of relations, the US-China relationship is becoming the world's most consequential. China is now our third largest export market, directly supporting 750,000 American jobs. In turn, our private sector has helped shape China's development. Despite hopes that China would embrace political and economic reform and opening, President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party have taken the country down a different path, increasing the role of state in society and the economy, constraining the free flow of capital and information, fusing economic and technology policy with military ambitions, and deploying coercive economic policies against both countries and non-Chinese companies. Secretary Raimondo and leadership across this administration are clear-eyed about the challenges that China's strategy poses for US interests and have adopted a multifaceted approach. Invest, align, compete. This strategy will help ensure that the United States continues to lead the global economy in the 21st century, fostering sustainable, equitable, inclusive growth while advancing our values, openness, transparency, rule of law. We're bolstering domestic competitiveness through transformational legislation. We're modernizing our approach to supply chain resiliency, export controls, and both inbound and outbound investment. We're aligning with allies to advance a shared vision for the future. And we're competing with China, leaning into our dynamism to promote our values and to lead the global economy. ITA is advancing the administration's efforts through a balance of protecting and promoting US interests. At the core of ITA's mission, is strengthening the competitiveness of US business and workers. Our team counsels companies, works to tackle China's numerous trade barriers, and shares knowledge to support US companies that are doing business in China. In light of China's turn away from reform, however, an increasing part of our work is helping US companies to build resilience against geopolitical shocks, against economic coercion, and against the buildup of heavily subsidized Chinese indigenous industries. Simultaneously, ITA is drawing on a wide array of economic tools to protect the broader US economy. To stand up to anti-competitive behavior, we are enforcing a record number of anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders. And we're counseling US businesses that are suffering from unfair trade practices. To protect the competitive, uh, competitiveness of critical US industries, we are helping implement a stronger inbound investment review regime. Simultaneously, we're identifying the best approaches to prevent outbound US investment flows from supporting foreign initiatives that would undermine our security. Investment review is particularly salient 
in strategic technology industries where we're working diligently to protect our unmatched innovation ecosystem, harnessing strong relationships with industry and other stakeholders to pursue effective action that minimizes unintended consequences. Still, while we must always be vigilant to protect our US economic and national security, China remains an important export market. Let me be clear, we do not seek to decouple from the Chinese economy. As President Biden has emphasized, we'll seek to work together to address global challenges and maintain a commercial relationship that's in line with US values and objectives. Our ITA commercial services team is on the ground in China, working to promote trade and investment in target sectors like consumer goods, environmental products, pollution control, and healthcare. But make no mistake, our promoting of US commercial interests will not distract from our number one priority, protecting and advancing our economic and national security interests. We'll mitigate downside risk and insist on high standards and human rights, from supporting enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act to helping businesses protect their, their intellectual property. These same principles guide our engagement with other emerging markets. We are not asking countries to choose between the United States and the PRC. What, rather, we present ourselves as a compelling alternative for principled partnership. So now let me turn to sectors that are front of mind for ITA. First, supply chains. Once this was a topic for policy wonks and logistics experts, but since the pandemic, supply chain issues have become both dinner table and boardroom conversations as, family, as both families and businesses grappled with bottlenecks, vulnerabilities, and shortages. Knowing that robust, resilient supply chains are central to our security and prosperity, the administration continues to take decisive action to alleviate issues in critical sectors, from medical devices to automobiles. Did you know that it is ITA's analysis and industry engagement that underpins efforts to resolve shortages and delays? Our team provides US producers with information to understand their vulnerabilities and obtain the inputs that they need to compete. We are building capabilities to proactively identify and reduce over-reliance, most especially on supply chains running through countries that don't share our democratic ideals. We aim to anticipate and mitigate future challenges to help ensure that the United States maintains secure and reliable access to the materials that are necessary to meet our needs, protect our security, and to lead the industries of the future. Not surprisingly, we have put supply chains at the center of our international engagements. We're also placing a special emphasis on promoting the export of cutting edge clean energy and climate resilience technologies. Since day one, the administration has been committed to combating climate change, both at home and abroad. Russia's illegal war against Ukraine heightens the imperative to accelerate the green transition, ensuring energy security and diversity of supply. This is especially salient in Europe, where we've supported our allies in obtaining new energy sources and infrastructure. To help address these twin crises, ITA is helping US businesses bring to global markets technologies to speed the transition to net zero emissions. A couple of statistics. In 2022 alone, we facilitated over $3 billion in clean tech exports. At the same time, we work with foreign interest, uh, entities that are interested in investing in US facility, facilities. Last year, we facilitated, we facilitated some 27 billion in clean tech investment into the United States, and this includes an electric vehicle battery plant that will create thousands of jobs in Ohio. The importance of this work extends well beyond its dollar value. By leaning into our strength in innovation, we're enabling other countries to both 
pursue their Paris commitments, but also achieve energy independence. Good as we are, we know that the United States alone can't solve the climate crisis. International cooperation is crucial. And that's why we've made climate a focus of our global engagement. This includes working through our small modular reactor public-private program to advance the commercial deployment of next generation US civil nuclear technology, which will help accelerate the transition from coal-fired plants. So, not surprisingly, another topic that's on the agenda for many of our bilateral and multilateral engagements um, is the digital economy. And most especially, ensuring robust cross-border data flows that are consistent with both privacy and security needs. We're pursuing this work by implementing the US-EU data privacy framework and by advancing a global cross-border privacy rule system for interoperable data regimes. We're also doing our part to protect partner nations from coercive influence, whether by encouraging the use of secure equipment in key telecommunications projects, boosting cybersecurity cooperation, or harnessing the potential of next generation technologies. So the final topic I want to raise is one that lies at the heart of the Biden-Harris administration, equity. Ensuring that growth at home is equitable demands not only increasing exports, but also increasing the pool of exports. Who is exporting? Equity is at the core of everything that we do at ITA, which is why we're committed to supporting rural, minority, veteran, and women-owned businesses. Equally, we're committed to serving micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs, which comprise the vast majority of US exporters. MSMEs are 85% of the clients that ITA serves. MSMEs and diverse businesses have unique advantages and huge potential for growth, but these same businesses often face obstacles, lack of opportunity, inaccurate perception of risk, insufficient financing, and challenges in identifying and vetting potential partners. In over 100 cities and towns across the US, ITA has trade specialists who help businesses overcome these ob obstacles so that they can grow in global markets. Now this entails revisiting our tools. They were developed for larger players and we're retooling them to make sure that they meet the needs of MSMEs. We have prioritized programming, support, and outreach to minority and women-owned businesses. We've brought diverse US businesses to the world. Last year, ITA led its first ever minority-focused trade mission, and we followed that with another first, a woman in tech trade mission that I had the pleasure of leading. We're meeting MSMEs in their own communities as part of our Global Diversity Export Initiative, GDEI. Now, GDEI leverages leading national chambers of commerce and diverse business associations to ensure that our trade shows, missions, and counseling services reach businesses in historically underserved communities. This includes working through our Building Bridges to Global Markets program, which has brought no cost, in-person expertise and resources to hundreds of businesses in communities from Jackson, Mississippi to Cleveland, Ohio. These initiatives are just the start. This year, we are doubling down, implementing a women's economic empowerment and entrepreneurship strategy, leading dedicated minority-focused trade missions to Brazil and a number of countries in Africa, promoting tourist destinations in underserved communities as part of our national travel and tourism strategy, tapping the potential of diaspora communities in building export relationships, and putting a spotlight on MSMEs as part of our APEC host year. So in conclusion, in my first year in this role, I've been in 18 countries and several states in the US. Now, while abroad, I have encountered a consistent hunger for US engagement and solutions. And here at home, I see a desire to strengthen businesses 
and communities through growth in global markets. At ITA, we're making major strides to address these mutually reinforcing demands, and our approach is well calibrated to a dynamic, interconnected, global economic landscape. I'm proud to be serving in an administration that is deploying a wide range of commercial and trade tools to advance our economic and national security, enhance the competitiveness of US businesses and workers, and promote equitable and sustainable growth in an open global system. Thank you all. Like to welcome to the stage to join Under Secretary Lago our good friend Wendy Cutler, the Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and a good friend of WIDA and a frequent partner with us on many of our webinars and in-person events. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wendy. Well, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Under Secretary Lago. You certainly covered a lot of territory, <laughs> both geographic and substantive. So just allow me to drill down on a few issues. Um, first, right before you spoke, Senator Crapo joined us. And I think it's fair to say he was kind of critical of US trade policy, and, <laughs> and specifically the reluctance of the administration to negotiate market opening, I think he said market opening, comprehensive, congressionally approved trade agreements. Um, he also said, and I quote, if the administration takes a time out on trade, Congress will step in. Would you like to respond? Gladly. <laughs> and I should also note for the audience that Wendy and I are buddies who go way back. We worked together closely um, when Wendy was at USTR and I was at the Department of the Treasury, so I'm thrilled that we're up here talking in this conversation. Um, Senator Crapo's views are long held and well known. Um, Senator Crapo, in fact, posed similar questions to me during my confirmation, during my nominations hearing. What I find interesting about the state of trade in the US mindset today is that even within Senator Crapo's own party, there are senators who have diametrically opposed views and the same holds true on the other side of the aisle. There is widespread disagreement about the role of trade and the nature of trade agreements within the United States. So against this backdrop, are we doing nothing? No, that's not an option. We are looking at what are the pressing issues of the day. Clearly, the digital economy is already here and is only going to grow. Um, that is an area where issues of tariff reduction just aren't salient. So we are doubling down on our commercial engagement with partners around the world. And as I mentioned in my remarks, we are coming up against a very welcome interest in commercial engagement with the US and with our industries. We know that we have an innovation economy that is the envy of the rest of the world. Um, so far from stepping back from trade, we are engaging in commercial dialogues that are addressing the issues that confront people today, whether supply chains, clean technology, digital trade. Maybe we can move to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPAF. Um, I understand commerce just completed four days of a very successful round in India. Um, coming out of that meeting, um, both the Indian um, trade minister as well as the Japanese representative have been in the press talking about the importance of early harvest. And I believe that someone even mentioned maybe early harvest by the um, trade minister's meeting in May um, in the United States. Is that possible? Well, let me give you a couple of insights into what just went on in Delhi. And I'll note that this meeting in Delhi came hard on the heels of a negotiating session in Brisbane in mid-December. We had over 300 delegates from the IPEF member nations. 
we also, as part of this negotiating round, held an in-person stakeholder listening session that included both Indian and US businesses. Um, we found the meetings to be positive, constructive, and turning to the US delegation, it's not just on the three pillars that commerce leads, it's not just commerce representatives. We have subject matter experts from across the full range of US um, government agencies, State Department, Treasury, EPA, DOE, on and on. Um, we, in structuring IPEF, realized that there could be the potential for different timing for each of the pillars. Um, we did not package it up and say all, none of the four will be resolved until all four are resolved, because we recognize that some could be easier than single others. Single undertaking approach. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not adopting that. So all 14 members are committed, um, I could say fast paced, but it's actually a blistering pace that we're undertaking. Um, Secretary Raimondo has been very public, public about her interest in seeing progress on the pillars that her agency leads this year. I would say as proactive as she is in public, she's even more so in private. This is clearly a priority for her. We're still in the early phases of negotiations. Um, we have yet another round planned um, in the coming month. And so I'm not going to speculate about which pillar might proceed on what time frame, but I have been heartened by the fact that this isn't a US push alone. It's not just a developed large economy push alone. Across the IPEF member nations, there is a sense of the significance of the undertaking and a desire to get each pillar done fast and again, not to hold up, the, uh, not to take a single undertaking approach. So the conclusion is it's possible. <laughs> You've heard me. <laughs> um, any indications that India might join the trade pillar? Um, uh, I would pose that to the Indian representatives. <laughs> Um, okay. Let's the reason for that question is that of the 14 IPEF member nations, 13 have chosen to join all four pillars, something that was not at all a foregone conclusion when we launched IPEF. Actually, having 14 members wasn't a foregone conclusion when we launched, and it is only India that has chosen not to join IPEF Pillar 1, the trade pillar. And just finally, before we leave IPEF, um, we all noted that USTR, at least at senior levels, this wasn't a joint negotiating round, it was a commerce-led round on their pillars. Is this kind of a one-off type of meeting or are we likely to see commerce going its own way and USTR going its own way? Um, I have to take issue with your characterization of Congress going its own way and USTR its own way. Um, we work so collaboratively with with USTR, um, I know that people would love to see a plot or some malign uh, interagency fighting going on. That's not the case. We saw the opportunity to make significant progress on the text that we had tabled. And so we seized the opportunity, coupled with India's interest in the three pillars that it's joined to host the meeting. And so we seized that opportunity. Um, because this is not a traditional trade agreement, um, to use a phrase that a few of us might be old enough to know, this is not your father's old mo Oldsmobile. This is a new approach to today's trade issues. We will be flexible in what meetings make sense among which groupings. Okay. So before we leave um, that region of the world, APEC, we're hosting APEC, yes. big year. Um, commerce plays um, a role in many different aspects of APEC, including leading the um, SME ministerial. We'll be holding one this year. I think last year- August in Seattle. August in Seattle. Last year, you, you led the um, commerce delegation. Um, given the importance of SMEs to the administration, I think you talked at the end about the importance of really broadening the net of um, of, of folks who participate in trade. Do you think Secretary Raimondo will lead the delegation this year? 
I think it's probably too early to know who will lead the delegation other than to assure that it will be a senior level official. If I could elaborate a little bit on um, our APEC host year, the overall theme is inclusivity, affirming an equitable and inclusive future for all. And that is going to suffuse all of the countless APEC work streams. Um, as you mentioned, I had the pleasure of leading the US delegation on the SME work stream. That's the only work stream on which commerce is lead. And um, we are going to build on Thailand's goals. Thailand was the host last year. And they called it the biocircular green economy, particularly focusing on green transformation for SMEs. Um, we anticipate that we are going to use digital tools, including digital trade, to help SMEs innovate and to compete globally. Now, um, the Department of Commerce also led an APEC project on promoting women's entrepreneurship through e-commerce for the past couple of years. And we're gonna expand on this during our host year. And I can give you a sneak preview. We are going to be holding a joint session of the SME ministers, but also the high level policy dialogue on women in the economy. We think that there is just such a- And they're both meeting in Seattle in, in August. Exactly, we just see such synergies um, there. Another focus that we have as part of our leadership of the SME track is um, a forum on APEC business ethics for SMEs. And we are going to be holding a session of that forum in Washington, Washington DC, not, not Seattle. And we focus on high standard code of ethics, on SME capacity building, and then strengthening the collective action around ethical business practices. So it's gonna be a ton of work, but we are very much looking forward to hosting APEC this year. It's a great opportunity. And I know right now, I think our our delegations are in Palm Springs, um, the first yes. official senior first officials meeting this year. Um, let's turn to China quickly, okay. and then we'll open the floor up for questions. Um, listen carefully on commerce's role. I think you use the terms protect, but also promote. Um, one thing maybe you could elaborate on, since there are a bunch of business folks out here, in terms of market access barriers that U.S. companies are facing in China, are we still working on those? If business comes to USTR with problems, excuse me, to commerce, sorry. <laughs> if, if, if business comes to commerce with market access problems or comes to the administration, is the administration still working those issues? Of course, as evidenced by the fact that we have commercial service, foreign commercial service teams on the ground. Yes, we promote exports, but once U.S. companies have exported, if they are running into barriers, we engage in commercial advocacy. That is at the core of what we do, and that's across the board, including in China. And is China picking up our phone when we <laughs> raise these barriers? <laughs> we are very actively engaged, Wendy, as you okay. know. <laughs> All right, open up to the floor. <laughs> Ken, you can help me here. I don't see anyone. I think you can. Uh, Robert Tobias, and formerly with Treasury, now head of the National Association of Beverage Importers, as in alcohol. Uh, it's uh, 34 years with Treasury. It seems to me in any program area there are there's a dichotomy of policy and operations. You know, the policy is the big macro. The operational side is the micro. Listening to your comments, under Madam Undersecretary, it seems that the ITA is what I would call the operational side. You're in the trenches, you're in the front, you're the first interface with a small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, USTR is more what I call the policy side, looking at the big picture, uh, the macro. Uh, in that bifurcation, how do you see the role of ITA in informing the policymakers on how to develop the direction uh, of, the, of the macro policy based on your interaction in the more granular 
operations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the question. It is spoken like a true Treasury veteran <laughs> focusing on the macro and the micro. Um, and again, it, your question also um, evidences your long tenure in government in understanding that USTR is charged with developing trade policy. But I think that your, um, the bifurcation that you talk about um, overstates things. We work with USTR not just every day, but multiple times a day. Wendy will know this from her time at USTR. And USTR picks up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, often they're the ones who initiate the phone calls. It goes both ways. Um, policy and implementation are not worlds apart. There is a very significant overlap. How do you develop good policy? It has to be informed by the experience of industry on the ground. We're proud at ITA that we engage with industry every single day. We learn from them, we hear what their issues are, and that directly feeds into our conversations with USTR and the resultant policy. And so I think it's a Venn diagram with very significant overlap. Great question. Hi, Marilee, International Trade Today. I wanted to ask about the somewhat unusual um, action last year where the president um, put a pause on the duties for circumvention of ADCVD with solar panels. And my question is, has that accomplished what was hoped? Um, I think the idea was that uh, projects were stalling and imports were stopping because people were concerned about how much duties they would have to pay as that case proceeded. So I want to know if, um, if imports kind of picked back up after the duty pause. There was another question back there too. Can we take that one as well? I thought I saw someone else back there. One on the side. Get your exercise. <laughs> Thank you, Jana Dreyer from Border Lakes, a, a trade policy publication based in Europe, but independent of EU institutions. Um, uh, I was very struck by your um, statement that national security is the overarching policy goal here, and that digital is basically number two. Um, I have a question. So what does this mean for ongoing negotiations in the WTO on an e-commerce uh, plurilateral agreement? Does that mean would the US be pulling out if this means doing a deal in digital with China? Thank you. Any, you could take one I'm more. I'm glad to no. take the, okay. those two okay, together. Um, in part because the two questions go to other parts of US government, the executive order, came from the White House. As you know, a significant part of what ITA, the International Trade Administration does, is make sure that other countries' companies live by the trade rules. And what is emblematic of that is our work on anti-dumping and countervailing duties. But the policy came from the White House, so you may need, uh, WIDA may need to invite someone from the NSC. Um, with respect to your question, again, a great question. But all things WTO are the province of USTR. OK. Um, who's got other questions? Let's try and keep it in commerce's wheelhouse. <laughs> Hi, um, this is Jonathan McHale from the computer and- Hi, uh, Jonathan. Yes, and <laughs> Communications Association. Um, the AFL-CIO has just put out a statement <clears throat> with respect to digital trade, um, essentially arguing that rules in the digital space are essentially designed solely for big companies and are adverse uh, in impact on um, uh, U.S. workers. Um, you have mentioned that you are promoting the free flow of, of data, um, uh, things like that that uh, affect this. How would you respond to their suggestion that rules in this space are not in the U.S. national interest from the perspective of workers? Thank you. 
Thanks for the question. I haven't seen the statement, so I'm not going to be responding directly to something that I haven't read. But um, digital trade is a reality. Uh, when people talk about the coming digital economy, it's here now. And that is why the administration has placed such a significant, um, such significant importance on assuring that we have free flow of information across the Atlantic. That's the new EU, ES, um, e EU US uh, data protection framework. Um, in all that we do, we look to um, adopt what Ambassador Tai has called a worker-centric approach to trade. We make sure that underpinning our thinking is an understanding of industry, an understanding of workers, an understanding of the environment, and also an understanding of balancing when it comes to data, the need for data as the lifeblood of commerce, but also the appropriate protection of privacy. It is something that is just in our DNA as we approach our discussions, both domestically and for ITA with our partners around the world. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can... We, um, have, we have one question I want to read that came in from our Zoom listeners. And they were following up on our panel yesterday on climate and trade, and they were wondering if you could expand a little bit on the role that uh, you see ITA and commerce playing in the global fight uh, against climate change. And who did the question come from, if I might? Do we know? Uh, it's, this one came in anonymously. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to have their name read. So hello, anonymous. Um, <laughs> but thank you for a question um, that is such a central part. We know that we are an innovation economy, that we produce technological solutions that can help countries around the world. Now, Folks, countries that are interested in our climate-related technologies used to care about it because they wanted to meet the demands for more energy in their nations, while at the same time meeting their Paris commitments. If we go back to February 24th of last year, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a third compelling reason, energy independence, and we have found ever increasing interest in the solutions that U.S. companies can provide. And when I say U.S. companies, of course it's the large multinationals that are already operating in this space, but it is also small, medium-sized startups um, that are part of our innovation economy. And when I say our innovation economy, it is the fact that we have research institutions that are the envy of the world. We take for granted protection of intellectual property, which cannot be assumed in way too many countries on the globe. And all of these feed into having companies that are at the cutting edge of every facet of green energy. I'm going to take the prerogative and ask the last, is this the last question, Ken? Okay. Africa. I hear yes. you're just back from a 40-hour return trip. Yeah. Um, I don't think I ever went 40 hours. Maybe Ambassador Schwab has, can match you there. <laughs> it had um, a little bit to do with a very delayed flight from Frankfurt home. <laughs> um, but I'd just be interested in, in your impressions there, and you know, particularly given um, the recent leaders summit um, that the president held with African leaders here. Secretary Yellen was just in Africa, now you, other administration folks. But it's coming at a time, really, where China's really out there, surpassed the United States with respect to trade with Africa, has surpassed the United States with respect to FDI in Africa. Um, can we still compete in that region? Have we kind of lost out? Are we behind? We can absolutely compete. There is such a, a hunger for and a welcoming of the U.S.'s engagement in the region. I think that there is a growing recognition among numerous African leaders that the initial appeal of lower cost financing comes with a cost. Um, the upfront costs are lower. China can move more quickly than we do, but it comes with a higher tolerance 
for corruption. And we are finding a growing skepticism about the sustainability of this way of operating. And a recognition is evident, this recognition is evident both in the government and in the private sector. Um, whenever I travel, obviously I meet with my foreign government counterparts. And being the Department of Commerce, it's not just a commerce or a trade ministry. It covers, I routinely meet with um, a foreign ministry, with an energy ministry. Um, in Zambia, given its economy, with the Ministry of Mines. And I also, though, always meet with the American Chamber of Commerce and very frequently with local chambers of commerce to hear the, the ground truth from the businesses that are there. And I meet with members of civil society, so the entire range. Um, as an aside, I'll also note that I hold a diversity-related event in every country that I meet with um, as evidence of our commitment in working to um, enhance in many countries the only element of diversity that is on the public mind is gender, um, but in other countries it extends far beyond just gender. Um, we believe we see that countries, including in Africa, recognize the benefit of US investors. Um, when U.S. companies invest, they pass along know-how. They also overwhelmingly hire locally, and so there is a long-term investment in the country. When we invest, our companies have high-quality standards. And if one looks at, in the context of government procurement, the cost not just up front of buying our goods, but the life cycle cost of, say, a power plant, the U.S. becomes far, far more competitive. So I am incredibly heightened, uh, heartened by the fact that in um, both Tanzania and Zambia, there is a recognition at the highest levels of government about the fact that corruption is a cost. I had the privilege in Zambia of spending 40 minutes in a meeting with President Hichilema. And I did not have to proactively raise points about corruption. It was front of mind on his agenda. And that certainly inures to the benefit of US exporters. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, uh, Madam Undersecretary, for your time. and. For joining us today. It's a pleasure to have hosted you for the first time here at WIDA. Um, everyone, we are taking just a very short break. I don't want you to all leave the room. We're just going to reset the stage for our final panel. So if you'll just bear with us, we'll be back on in about 10, less than 10 minutes.